This week we got another special guest. Today we're talking to Adam Online. He's a Metal Gear enthusiast, a Twitch variety streamer, a machinima maker. He's been in the Metal Gear community for a long time. Just recently started uh, dabbling in the MGS1 speedrun community. How's it going today, buddy? Yeah, it's great. Thanks for having me on. I've had like two monsters and 50 cups of coffee today, so I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Damn. How are you not <laughs> dead? Uh, severe caffeine resistance due to caffeine addiction, pretty much. <laughs> I'm trying to cut back and like one cup of coffee a day and then... It's if I want anything, it's either water or green tea. Oh, uh, maybe I should do that. I, I gotta drink ginger ale, but I can't like the closest thing I can do to caffeine is tea. Otherwise I just get like a, become a problem child. Anything higher than that? <laughs> Coffee's just too much. Yeah, it's way too much. Is that what speedrunning is? Is just you guys are all just like hopped up on shit and playing video games? Yeah, pretty much. We're um we're chemically enhanced, yeah, mm-hmm. on, okay. on the old stimulants, on the old caffeine. <laughs> hey, I'm Fingers. Hey, everyone. This is Days Ahead. And I'm Nitroid. You're listening to the Kojima Frequency. I was going to say, because some of those things that you guys pull off are just impossible to follow sometimes. Like, I don't even want to think about how much you practice. Oh, I, I spent the whole... We, <laughs> we decided on it, I think it was like a week and a half before, before the day. And I pretty much spent the entire week just, just practicing my runs and chipping away at, uh, at my times and things like that. Um, getting the, the roots and things down. Uh, getting up early for it. And, and for those that didn't see it, uh, there was a race, actually, between Adam Online and Perfect Stealth uh, on Twitch. They did it on multi-Twitch, actually, so you could kind of just watch both of them going at the same time. And it was, man, it was neck and neck there for a while, but then one little small error like, can just flip the whole race around. And sadly, that's what happened yeah. uh, with Adam here. That's all it takes. But uh, yeah, dude, for you just learning this this run like in the past week man like that's that was impressive man like what what was your final time on the run my final time on the run was one hour and 36 minutes jesus my personal best was one hour and 34 okay um i had it in my head that i wanted to get as close to one hour 20 as i could and i think with the run that i've got i think i could do it with no mistakes mm-hmm. uh but yeah unfortunately i uh, i made a couple of mistakes along the way there so I, uh, I ended up with one hour 36, but it was good fun nonetheless. Yeah, and shout out to Perfect Stealth. Uh, he, he's like a <laughs> he's a machine when it comes to these runs, man. He's, he's out there oh, like yeah. just not making mistakes. He's, he's been practicing this game for how long? I'm not sure. You, you probably know that information more than I do. Oh, years and years, man. He used to, um, he used to do a bunch of speed running um, on MGS1. So he, for him, it was kind of just like dusting off the old techniques, you know, getting familiar with it again. Yeah, had an advantage for sure. Yeah. Speedrunning can seem kind of intimidating. Um, I've tried to look into it before, but it seems like there's just, there's a ridiculous amount of information on it. Like, where in the world do you even start if you want to get into it? So, How did you start? I started basically just by saying, uh, I, I, I was conscious of going into it, and I didn't want to just uh, kind of emulate someone else's route. Um so I just said to Stealth, I was like, do you have any, any tips? And he gave me a couple of uh, kind of essential tips, like um, canceling animations by equipping a weapon and, and things like that, um, things that drastically help and they're, they're considered kind of essential. I was like, cool, that's, those are good building blocks. I'll, I'll build up from there. Um, and then I, I did a couple of streams, um, and I had a couple of the guys from the, the speedrunning community actually uh, join me in chat and... Um, it was fun because we, you know, they, they were interacting with me and, and giving me pointers and, and tips and things like that. So that was my process. I kind of just started by playing it how I know with those added, you know, extra sort of essential techniques you need to know for it and then just chipping away at it. And I'd do a part and then someone would chime in and say, oh, you could, you know, you can do this a bit quicker if you if you do this or you, or you do that, you know. So it was just kind of 
chipping away at it slowly. So how far of like, when you started doing this, what, what sort of times did you start at? And then like, what's, what's been the progression since then? Uh, Just so my, my curiosity. Yeah. So my first time was one hour 55. That was my, my first attempt. So I did a couple of playthroughs uh, and then I was like, right, okay, this is my attempt number one. And that was one hour 55. And then, as I say, you know, I had people in chat kind of giving me, you know, tips and pointers and things. Um, and I managed to cut that down then to 130, 134, which is, is still my best time. And I, I did that on my second run. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, using using techniques like, um, you know, stun lock and ocelot and things like that. So it's, it's the bosses, I find, is where you can quite easily lose a lot of time. Um so learning some techniques to to kind of reduce the time it takes to beat the bosses, I think that's the key part. Everything else is just memorizing roots. And there's a little bit of RNG with the bosses as well that you've got to kind of take into account and and uh, and minimize. So for example, if you if you go into the fight with Sniper Wolf, um, for me I found that getting started with that fight, I, I needed her kind of in a specific position. Um, otherwise, she can just keep shooting you and she gets a lot of shots off. So one technique you can do is if you if you look uh, in first person view and then lean with uh, L1 or R1, Sniper Wolf always shoots where um, Snake's, I guess, character model actually is, which the camera isn't. And that's what kind of has the hitbox, I guess. So any shots she, she makes at you when you're... Um, leaning in first person view, she'll actually miss. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll go in, I'll lean, make sure she um, misses the shot, and then I'll get my PSG one out while she's on the move, and and you know, train my sights on her and go from there. So, yeah, there definitely seems a lot of R, like a a lot of RNG in that fight. Like the, that's always just a pretty random fight. And then I think I think they mentioned that like Vulcan Raven tends to be the most RNG. Yeah. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so there's there's a technique. I actually tried it on the uh, on the race, and I got lucky with the RNG. So when you start the fight, he can either go north or I think he can go west in the uh, in the permafrost room. And if he goes north, you can actually stun lock in with the Nikita. But it's important when you do that not uh, to kind of. Um, blow, like unequip the Nikita and it'll blow up in front of him and that kind of keeps his attention looking south. If you accidentally send the missile uh, to his right or to his left or, or behind him, um, that'll kind of get him back on track and he'll escape the stun lock and carry on running around as normal. So uh, that's RNG, whether or not he moves north initially at the start of the fight. And um, yeah, he did that for me, but unfortunately I kind of detonated the, the missile uh, too close to him, I think it was to his left or to his right, and that moved his attention elsewhere, and he carried on running. So, yeah, there is a bit of RNG there. Huh. So you started this um, on the PC version, right? Yeah, yeah. So, have you have you done much with like MGS One on PS One, or is this something like you're only gonna stick to like the PC version, or like I guess because there's there are some sort of there are there aren't really any structural differences between the two i guess mm -hmm. it's mostly just little aspects of it that have changed but i know um one reason that speedrunners tend to like the pc version is because of the hotkeys glitch is that right yeah i i was watching uh who was i watching earlier on the on the metal gear speedrun channel um jaguar king i think he yeah. holds some some pretty high um completion times he's he's definitely up there uh you know, top five, I think. I'm not sure exactly which position, but um, he did a glitch. Um, basically, you know, the walkway, after you rappel down, you've got the three guards at the end of the walkway. He essentially just ran straight at them and they, and they were firing at him. Um, and he just ran through them and, and carried on through the door. And I clipped it and I sent it to Stealth and I was just like, dude, what the hell's happening here? How is he doing this? And he's like, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the hockey glitch. So something to do with equipping, I think, the Nikita or the Stinger, switching to the Chaffs, using the hotkeys, and yeah, that that's like a, an inv invincibility glitch, essentially, but yeah. It's so crazy how people like figure out stuff like that. It's like <laughs> you had to be yeah. sitting there just like pressing something over and over. 
Like I, I remember just figuring out little small things in like Mario sixty four when you had to do that like backflip through the the staircase and you know that like got you through a little zone. Dude, I thought I was the shit when I put on the bandana with the last three Famas rounds. Uh, <laughs> and I like just you're had like a tracer. Did you get the tr- yeah, like you're Did you get the tr- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so good. I used to do that all the time. Oh man. I call that the laser beam run. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Should be its own category. Laser beam percentage. Well, uh, me and me and Fingers were talking about, you know how like the PC port has like the, the water and ninja effects? We were talking about doing a no water and ninja effects run. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't actually seen it with those turned off, to be honest. That's what I'm saying. We need to we need to put that out there. There's a demand for it. <laughs> it's true. We're, we're, it's it's out of cl- for the culture, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, but to that point, you know, do you? This was one of the questions that I I had sort of at the back of my mind when we when we were planning for this episode. But is is what particularly in the Metal Gear Solid speedrunning community? Is there like a standard as far as like console versus emulation versus like the PC version? And additionally, like, do you find that, you know, the what's the word I'm looking for? The sustainability or or sometimes lack of sustainability with older consoles is influencing that standard? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think it's generally preferred isn't it to to be on the the original console that whatever title you your speed running kind of originated on i think I think there's a preference there for that um which which makes sense to me you know it's kind of um uh, kind of authentic then isn't it um you're not right you know you're not relying on the hardware to kind of get you through it like i mean like on the on on the p c version of of MGS1, it was, I mean, it's got its issues, right? You know, audio being, you know, one of the main issues with it. But for me personally, because I originally paid, played it um, and, and still do on my PS3, uh, the PAL version, it actually runs at a lower hertz than the, is it the NTSC, the, you know, the, the American region version? Yeah. So mm-hmm. getting to play it um, on the PC, which which is the, you know, the, the American region version, um it just runs at a higher frame rate. It's much more responsive, um, and it's just generally much nicer to play than the original PAL version. I find. Hmm. That's interesting. I, I never really thought about that about the just the different hertz, kind of just making it feel better to play. If I remember right, the PAL version was the one they put on. Um, I don't know if it was Metal Gear Solid, but I know that when they released the PlayStation Classic, some of the uh, games were PAL versions. There was there was a mix between PAL and, and NTSC on there. Oh, that must have been frustrating for for people in the US. Oh yeah, people hated that. Yeah. So I'm curious: is um, when it comes to emulation, I've always wondered if in speedrunning emulation is sort of like a faux pas of sorts. You know, is that is that does emulation tend to be avoided in the speedrunning community? Honestly, I'm I'm not too sure. Um, I think it might have a category of its own. So, like when you, when you're saying you know you're you're speed running Metal Gear Solid One, you, I think you need to specify how you're doing it um, as a, as a part of the the kind of conditions for your speed running. You need to say right, okay, I'm, I'm doing this on an emulator, or you know I'm doing this on an OG PlayStation or a PS3. Um, I know it's like that for you know Metal Gear Solid. Two, for example, whether you're doing it on a PlayStation Two or you're doing it via the HD collection, so I think they separate it out. Um, especially because on the PC version uh, of MGS One, for example, you can just skip codecs instead of having to mash X to go through every single line until you get to the end of the conversation. So that obviously affects the time. Um, but I think as long as you're kind of specifying which platform you're running it on, um, yeah, I think you're okay. 
Yeah, emulators have all those different things where you can just like adjust the frame rate and you know the frames per second and the frame save lock states. And, yeah, just hotkey back to your last save. Fast forward button. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Brr, I'm done. <laughs> Tool assisted Metal Gear speed run. <laughs> Fast forward button go. Brr. Okay. Brr. Uh. <laughs> so how have you? Um, what do you think of the PC re-release? Because that's kind of uh, there's some mixed opinions on that. Oh yeah, and I I can totally understand people's misgivings with it. Um, the audio for one. So I mean, I'll I generally you know play MGS One fairly often on stream, and I think a couple of months ago I did a run and I did it with Integral, um, not from good old games though, obviously because it hadn't been released yet. Yeah. Um, and the general consensus from the audience was. Um, next time just go back to the PlayStation because it you know it's it <laughs> because it has all the you know the correct music and it, you know all the, you know the boss fight music that everyone obviously gets nostalgic over and, and the original version has all that whereas the integral version even though for me as a player it feels nicer to play um, feels upgraded in some respects in terms of the gameplay um, I think the experience as a viewer is a bit bit reduced because of things like the music. It is a bit awkward, um, and it, it, I mean, it even is a little bit off-putting as a player, because that, that was the one thing that kind of threw me off, was when the, particularly when the background music, like, loops. Yeah. And, I'm, like, I was confused, I was apologizing to my stream, um, but I didn't realize that was, like, inherently part of the game. <laughs> Just thought your computer was messing up. Yeah, it's strangely cut, isn't it? Yeah. I think you, you touched yeah. upon it um, a couple of episodes ago where um, they, did they get it from a fan site or, or something like that? They didn't have access to the direct music files, did they? So yeah. they had to kind of get yeah. creative. Yeah, with it. yeah. the resources were late. They are adding fixes to it, though. Uh, what did they, they added that hotfix for the D-pad support. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. So it does seem like they're gonna try to fix some of this stuff. I guess I guess GOG is doing that work, or I don't know if they're. It's not clear if it's being done by Konami or GOG. I actually um, I reached out to try and get a comment on that, but they weren't sure. Gotcha. Or the person uh, the person I spoke to wasn't sure anyway, so it's hard to say who's doing those fixes. I suspect it's GOG, but you know I don't know. And I and I wonder how far those repairs can actually go because some of these issues are pretty fundamental. Yeah, and like what what visual glitches did they fix? Was that in the notes? Um, I see that's part of it, but Oh hold on, I got the change log. I know there were there were uh issues with Meryl clipping through things, I guess. Yeah, I saw her freak out uh, in the in that one scene. You know, after after Snake calls her a rookie and stuff, uh, she had her gun out and she was just like shaking and just you know her model was just freaking out. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty funny, but it's like, damn, I know you're funny, nervous, yeah. but you know, relax. Yeah, that's what made it even funnier. I was just like, wow, she really is uh, having some rookie feelings right now. I, I know me in particular. I had an experience where. Um, you know those columns in the area before the, the the nuke building. I think it's basement one where you meet Meryl. The the columns that are in front of the respective bathrooms. Mm -hmm. um, generally, you know they're supposed to. When you see the top of them from your top down view, you're supposed to see like you know just a, a blank spot or dark spot indicating yeah. this is where the column is. Well, sometimes it clips instead, or like the the texture or the the bottle texture doesn't come through with the skin. So, like, the pillar is just clear, so you kind of see that green marble. Um, ah. And if Meryl runs through it, you can see Meryl. It, it really throws you <laughs> off. Another thing that threw me off a lot with the PC version, um, because they have to take out all those, you know, all those novelties about the Psycho Mantis fight, the pacing of the cutscene is so off. And even if you've never seen, you know, the, the full version of Psycho Mantis, um, even you, you would still feel like something's wrong. <laughs> so I took a look on the website because they keep a change log of all of the updates they make. And it looks like the day after they added D-pad support and fixed the clipping issues, they also fixed, uh, I guess, a volume issue when you're in the communications tower. Um, 
And that wasn't one that I noticed when I played through it, but it looked, you know, they're they're keeping up with this. The volume issue, is that, um, I don't know if it's the same thing, but I've noticed when you're uh, doing the fight in Ascent, um, when you get the alert, um, I've noticed it doesn't play all the audio at the same time. So when, if you're like firing your fan ass or something, um, it's played really muted. So it could be, it might be that that they fixed. It might actually. be. Yeah, they're hitting it piece by piece, so I'm curious how far they'll go with this. I'm wondering if there's going to be any kind of modding community around it now that it's more readily available, you know, e easy to pick up on good old games. I'm wondering if anyone's going Maybe. to Maybe. I'd like to it. see them fix the music. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, exactly yeah. what I had in mind. I would love to have, like, an infinite heaven, but for Metal Gear Solid 1. I, I oh don't know how, how the malleability of the game, but that would be so good. That sounds amazing. I could definitely get behind that infinite heaven has just revitalized five for me yeah, it's essential it would be interesting to see if they could restore and, and this is pie in the sky thinking i doubt it's going to happen maybe maybe in the modding community if it takes off but it would be interesting to see if they could restore some of the content from the playstation version of integral into this version that didn't make the cut so things like the additional radio stations where you can read developer commentary, and obviously that would have to be translated since that was entirely in Japanese, but uh, or the, the, the Metal Gear Solid remixes of tracks from Metal Gear 2, uh, things like that would be interesting to see. That would be great. I'm still shocked that they didn't create a, a desktop icon for VR missions. Oh. Like, how many people out there have no idea killing me, that man. even exists? Yeah. It's killing me. Got to write a letter. It's just buried in the game files, isn't it? It is. Yep. We, uh, we actually did, um, Nitroid was nice enough to do kind of a disclaimer in our last episode, just indicating that you have to find the executable. Yeah. And it's like MGS VR and MGSI. Right. And you know what's weird is the VR missions, when I loaded it up, it's um it's completely unlocked. Everything is open right from the start. There's no there's no progression to go through cuz typically you start with some basic missions and then as you play further missions unlock and then eventually you open up the photo mode where you can go into that little VR arena and take pictures of Naomi and Mei Ling. But you're you're kept outside of a certain range, right? There's like an invisible wall that you can't go past. But then as you complete more missions, the wall shrinks until you can get right up close to them and take better photos. And so you have to essentially complete all of the missions in order to take photos if you want to, right? But in this version, everything is unlocked, including the photos. <laughs> so it's all done. Hmm. Like the, the ninja mode was a reward that you got in the VR missions. You had to, you had to earn it if you wanted to play as Gray Fox. I remember that. And here it's just like, all right, go ahead. <laughs> so that was kind of weird. Was it like that in the Integral version? Like the original Integral? No, you had to unlock everything. Okay, so it was just like the original PlayStation version of VR mission. Okay, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, the VR missions that we got here in the US is really just the third disc of Integral. There's, there's not really any change. Mm -hmm. Huh. Well, so like... I could have really used that as a kid, but I'll, uh, yeah, I'll have to check it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time since I played those ninja missions. I can't, can't wait to give those a, another whirl. Oh, those are so much fun. Yeah. Maybe that could be like a speedrunning thing? Could be. How many, how many are there? I think there's, what, three missions or something? Three or maybe five? Something yeah. Like that. So I've got a question um, because I never really looked close enough to find out since I didn't spend a lot of time with the PC version um, until recently, and I still haven't uh, gone through everything. But in the PC version, did they keep or remove the alternate guard routes? Oh, they kept it, and I cannot wait to dive into that. Oh, yeah. thank God. So I finished my first speed run through, uh, went on to new game and saw the option of alternate routes. I was like, what the hell is this? And yeah, Stealth told me, I was, oh, it's, it's uh, you know, rearranged guard routes and things. I was like, oh my God, I cannot wait to have a go at that. It's just going to be oh, a, nice. another new way to enjoy Metal Gear, kind of 
almost as if you're playing it for the first time, you know? Can't wait to give that a go. That is cool that they included that. I, I didn't know that was that was on this one. Yeah, that's some of my favorite parts of like Resident Evil, so that's exciting. Just a Metal Gear randomizer. Yeah. Don't. Oh God, <laughs> please. <laughs> you just like I just imagine an MGS2 randomizer where you go. I don't know. Like you go into the tanker, and then next thing you know, you're like riding stuck with Fortune. Uh, that's the beauty of randomizers. <laughs> First thing you pick up is the coolant. You're just like, fuck. <laughs> hey, hey, man. Hey, man. If there's something I've learned from speedrunners and big boss runners is that that coolant is OP in Arsenal gear. Oh, that's going to be. I'll tell you, one thing that surprises me is that with the popularity of like randomizers and now I think they call it chaos mode in some games. You know what I'm talking about? Have you seen that? Yeah. Okay, if, you, if for anybody who doesn't know, Chaos Mode is something that I believe started in GTA V where you have uh, a script running that adds a random effect to the game every, like, 30 seconds or so. So it might change the gravity or it might make cars invisible or you might teleport somewhere random, things like that. And so... And are these things stacking? Um, they like, stack, or are they switching from one to the they other? They stack in like I think you can control it, but the one I've seen was the one I saw stacked up to five at a time, and they were on timers. So like after every thirty seconds, one will drop off and another will stack on. So and I mean it's it's all sorts of like random stuff where like all cars are now green, for example, or meteors are now falling from the sky, or like it's it's stuff you can. You, you could hardly even imagine it's so randomized. But um, I, I've heard of, like, other games starting to pick that up now, too, and so I'm starting to wonder with, like, the popularity of randomizers, especially in the Resident Evil community, and uh, Chaos Mode and all these things, like, when are AAA game developers going to start integrating these as, as like, default features? Because they increase the replay value of these games like crazy you know i screwed over a buddy one time uh he had a gta 3 file where he was on the last mission oh no I know uh, where yeah this is going. you know there you know where this is going and so we were just playing around and uh we turned on the riot mode with that cheat oh no <laughs> oh no and so we were playing around and playing around and we saved <sighs> yep is that one of those ones you can't turn off yeah, that was one of the ones where you couldn't turn it off. And I don't know if you remember, that last mission on GTA 3 it was hard it, as shit. But now, it, imagine like everyone's things. trying to kill you, and uh, it was impossible. So I pretty much wrecked his game file with that, and just, yeah. that like it's, It was soon That's after hilarious. that, you, you kind of saw cheats like that kind of disappearing. Like, once trophies and multiplayer and stuff started coming around, they were like, alright, yeah, let's cut this out, but... Yeah, they kind of had to. Maybe, maybe Saints Row did a little bit of it, but uh, maybe maybe that's why they they stopped doing that because <laughs> maybe it just somewhere that could like corrupt the 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 data somewhere in it. Well, for, like from my another thing from like my understanding too is that um, cheat codes they're primarily used for you know like debugging purposes. So the period of time where cheat codes were kind of like their, their heyday. Um, you know, it was the type of thing that you used as a debugging tool. And then, you know, th it was easier just to like implement it as a cheat code than try to hide it. Gotcha. And I think nowadays, especially with the advent of like achievements and things like achievements and, and better technology and, and, you know, higher production budgets. Um, it, it's not just that, you know, they're trying to sell you the cheat codes, but there's less scenarios in which cheat codes can be implemented. Yeah. And a lot of games, too, will just be like, all right, well, fine, we're we're going to disable trophies and shit if you want to use cheat codes. And it's yeah. like, all right, that's that's like a good medium for it. It's like, or just in, any multiplayer, you know, gameplay, definitely don't cheat. You're a piece of shit. Um. <laughs> so here's a question. If you were going to put something like a chaos mode into Metal Gear Solid Five, what would you include? All rations and our time bombs. Snake, get that bomb out of your... <laughs> <laughs> like randomly fault in your buddy uh reflex mode kicks in 
out of nowhere. Just have random uh, pitfalls placed everywhere. Just those little... Summon Sahelanthropus. He just drops in in the middle of oh, a mission. Jesus. Guards, guards, like regular guards and mooks just turn into skull units. Oh, God. Random skull placement. Shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, oh, and it would say, like, on the readout on the screen, guest starring the skull's parasite unit. <laughs> Boaster. It would just come up randomly. <laughs> <laughs> your your camo changes randomly. Yeah, that'd be cool. Like, on the on the outside, you don't see them. It's kind of like a snatcher-type situation. They just look like a normal human, but then all of a sudden they just turn on you and they have skull abilities. Infinite, Infinite Heaven, Heaven does allow... Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, Infinite Heaven developers, if any of you just so happen to listen to this podcast, um, we're out here and we're making suggestions, and if you think those <laughs> suggestions are good, you know, please put them as a story on your JIRA board. <laughs> I will... Talking about the skulls, there is um, uh, you can set the percentage chance that you will be randomly attacked by the skulls unit or other events like um, you'll deploy in a mission and there's a percentage chance that um, you know Pequod will be shot down and it won't you know you won't actually see that but you'll start the mission on foot on the ground with no items and you can't call in the chopper or um, call in for, you know, supplies or uh, airstrikes or anything like that. You're just kind of on your own. Yeah. So Infinite Heaven does have that kind of uh, that kind of stuff. So I haven't messed with Infinite Heaven much. Is it, like, randomly generated objectives as well? Um, no, not randomly generated objectives, no. It has, it has quite a few of those, um, those events, um, as they're called. Uh, and you can, you can tweak everything. In, uh, with Infinite Heaven, guard view distance, hearing range, you know, OSP, anything you'd like, weather. It's um, if if you if you're considering jumping back into MGS Five, I would fully recommend Infinite Heaven because you can really tweak your experience to how you want it. And going back to what you were saying about mods allowing replay value, it definitely does that for MGS Five. I haven't used it in a while. Is it still using that like text UI where it just the menu just kind of shows up as like your your updates on your radio? No, so there's um, there's a, a an add on for it now called uh, iHext. I think it's called. Um, mm -hmm. It basically just opens a little little uh, window in in your game, and you can cycle through it like uh, any other menu. So it's it's much oh, more nice. easy to navigate now instead of just the you know the the text sort of iDroid type messages. Okay, cool. Thanks for the suggestion. I'll write that down right now. Yeah, I got to give that a shot later. That was one part in the Phantom Pain that I, I kind of appreciated. I, I saw a lot of people complain about it, but just having those those missions with the modifiers on it, like the subsistence, the extreme, and the, the total stealth versions, like I, I don't know. I, I kind of enjoyed those for what they were. I, I, I wanted more of those personally. Um, I can see them being like just considered part of like chapter two and just like filling up more missions you know but just being like a detriment but uh i don't know i i enjoyed them being there like i like playing the those missions with the restrictions on them yeah i thought it was yeah. pretty cool and yeah if, if the placement was different then maybe maybe people would have taken it yeah the execution is a little sloppy yeah it is just kind of shocking the length that some fans in the modding community will go i mean Getting back to the PC port, fans are more or less singularly responsible for making that, making the PC port of Metal Gear Solid 2 Substance actually playable. It's uh, it, it, to the point that um, GOG themselves recommend using the fan patch uh, if you're going to install it and give it a shot just because of how many things it fixes, from, like, controller support to widescreen support, um, graphics issues. Uh, it just, you, you got to hand it to the fans. Yeah, definitely. That, that V's fix is absolutely essential. Yeah, I'm actually kind of shocked GOG was like, you know what? Yeah, just install this thing. Like, it's on their FAQ. It's hilarious. <laughs> I mean, why not? You know, I mean, I guess it's you know it's not official, but since they don't have anything official out now besides the couple of hot fixes that they've done, it's like, yeah, I mean, that, you know, that thing checks out. Seems to not be a virus or anything malicious. So, 
That's, yeah, that that is good on good old games. Good guy, good old games. Just being being good. Yeah, they seem self aware enough to just kind of embrace it. Give us Metal Gear too. <laughs> to that point, <laughs> like, will we see, you know, maybe like a rematch of you and Stealth with oh, Metal, Metal Gear Two? Yeah, okay. we we got a got a couple of things planned. Uh, Metal Gear Solid Two will be one of them. Um, the other thing that we're we're kind of exploring the idea of at the moment as well is um, Peace Walker. So we had a kind of a quick look to see if uh, there was much of a speed running community for Peace Walker, and as far as we can tell, there isn't. Um, so what we're planning on doing is doing like a, a two v two, so kind of my team versus Stealth's team speed run. Um, to finish Peace Walker with whatever rules we come up with. Not sure if it's going to be starting with 100% save or um, or starting from scratch or whatever it is, but Peace Walker's on the cards, so we'll, we'll be uh, we'll be looking to do that sometime soon, I think. Now, do you remember you were talking about doing something with uh, Metal Gear Solid 3? Oh, yeah. 3, I think, is, is uh, prior to a week and a half ago before I started learning 1. I think that was probably my... my most consistent Metal Gear, the one that I'm probably best at. So we will definitely do three at some point. See, as that's well. what you need to do. Get 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 perfect stealth on your level on some shit that you're familiar with. Yeah, get him out of his All comfort right. zone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, shout out perfect stealth. Yeah, hell yeah. He's a buddy. Peace Walker seems like it would be such a hard one to speed run though. Yeah, I mean you got a lot of downtime, right? Developing items and things, sorting your uh your base management and stuff like that out. But we also think it might be interesting because there's you know, there's there's lots of kind of shortcuts and stuff you can take if you're co-op. You know, like plopping down boxes that you can climb on top of and things like that. So we're going to explore the option of it. We think it, it could be uh, could be an interesting one. But like you say, it might be difficult because of, you know, a couple of different factors. But, we you know, so that's why we think we might start with a with a 100% save file and just do the missions or... Yeah, just start with the same file. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At some point, especially if you guys are going to get more involved with these speedruns, um, I, I do think that we should have another speedrunning episode, and hopefully we can get both Stealth and Adam in the same place at the same time. That would be great. Yeah, I'd love to do that. That's not speedrunning. <laughs> no, we can speedrun the episode. It'll be like five minutes <laughs> long. Uh, well, it's good to know that um, you know there's definitely going to be more of those events soon. Um, and I think you guys are, there's like even like a, a group on Twitch. It's Metal Gear Speedrunners. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually watch, uh, I've been watching a lot of those guys. Um, and, you know, since, since we started the challenge and stuff. And they're, they're real good. Really, really good. They're, they're the experts. So. Yeah. The community definitely seems to like to like just share secrets and kind of just, you know, no one's really like, Recording how to do it, you know, and like gatekeeping it really. It's kind of just like a very open community for the most part. Yeah, um, not at all gatekeeper. You know? I mean, like I said, through some of my practice runs and things and during the race itself, you know, I had a few of the guys in um, from from the speedrunning community kind of give me tips and, and talking me through some some of my routes and stuff. So that was that was really great. Yeah. You know, as I'm watching, for instance, the um, – the speed run that you had with perfect stealth the other day. Mm -hmm. Um, there's very clearly, you know, that's not the same strategy that you would do if you're trying to do like a big boss run, for instance, yeah. like you're not going to trigger alarms. You're not going to kill enemies. You're not, you're especially not going to kill Johnny, for example. Um, but to that point, like, you know, with those sort of discretionary actions or, or whatever you want to call it, um, how prevalent is like our like big boss runs, um, European extreme runs in the Metal Gear speedrunning community. I think they're pretty common. Like I said, I was I was watching um, Jaguar King earlier, just shortly before this, actually, and I think he was going for a, a big boss run. And I, I guess I mean, you know, big boss rank um, is the highest accolade you can get in any Metal Gear, right? And it's difficult as enough as it is, um, especially in I think MGS One. So to add speed running on top of that, I think that's just a whole other level uh, above, you know. Yeah. Um, right. Take, takes uh, takes a lot of skill, I think, to not only do it fast, but do it with all the the extra restrictions that the game imposes on you. It's pretty hardcore. Oh, definitely. So, what would you say is the most popular category in speed running for MGS One? 
Or in general, I guess. So I, from what I've seen, um, I think it's... Um, I don't necessarily know what's most popular, but um, most of the categories do include some glitches. So we were, we were actually looking to see how we stacked up against um, some of the other speedrunners, you know, the actual speedrunners that were doing this. And we noticed there wasn't actually a category for um, you know, normal, quickest time, all bosses, no glitches. Um, because there are a number of glitches in the game that like skip um, quite, a, quite substantial parts of the game. Um, Entire sections, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but even, you know, so that's one category. Glitches allowed, no holds barred, skip entire sections of the game, get it done as quick as you can. And then there are other, there's another category then for all bosses. So glitches are allowed, but you have to fight all the bosses. So, um, for example, when you, after you fight Ocelot and you're about to go into the, um, the minefield, um, you need to wait for Meryl to call you and then to open the door. And yeah, so there's, there's a, there's a cutscene involved, an unskippable cutscene where the door opens and you've got access to the minefield. But there is a glitch there where you can, um, out of bounds clip. Um, you clip yourself into the vent, and <clears throat> excuse me, you you um you run around the outside, and just go behind the door, and it skips the cutscene, and it puts you on the other side of the door in the minefield. But obviously, you know that's a glitch. There's another one with Sniper Wolf where you can. <clears throat> it's called a weapons glitch, and you can essentially just run straight up to Sniper Wolf. Um, it allows you past that point where. You know, if you if you try to run up to her, she'll automatically shoot you back. But it it kind of bypasses that, and you can just go straight up to her and just shoot her with your socom or whatever. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. That's yeah, it's actually really insightful because you can you can kind of see how the AI's programmed to always kind of hide in cover. So, you know, you if you go straight up to her, um, she'll always try to put herself in cover away from snakes. So, whether that's behind a uh, a pit, one of the pillars that are up there or not, and she'll kind of like glitch out a little bit and flick between one side of the pillar and the other, trying to keep cover between her and Snake. So it's interesting to see the AI broken in that way, you know? Yeah. You're not supposed to be back here. Yeah. What are you yeah. doing here? What are you doing? Hey. I've always liked that element of like fucking with the AI and, and, um, Sequence breaking. I, I always enjoyed sequence breaking. I don't know how how prevalent this is in in Metal Gear Solid One speedrunning, but when I was a kid, I loved getting like using my Game Shark to get the level ten pal card, and then you know once you go to the prison to pick up the DARPA chief, if you use it at the level six door where you're actually supposed to escape from the torture, you sequence break into the torture as if you know you did your three three rounds. And yeah. Ocelot's getting you the catch up. And I always thought that was fun. Is that like, is that a thing in the speedrunning community? I'm just curious. Just childhood curiosity. Yeah, I mean, that what you talked about there with using your, um, your, your Game Shark or whatever, that's that's actually something that, the, you know, the, the glitch um, not all bosses speedrunners do. You can actually, again, I think you clip into the vent um, that's just before the ladder, before you go into the air vent. Mm -hmm. You can kind of clip into that and you don't need the the card key you just run around the out of bounds area and it just Damn. jumps you straight forward to the uh the torture scene so that's another nice. thing that the speedrunners do as well yeah cool. I'm just curious besides speedrunning and doing the streaming and stuff uh you've worked on a machinima series uh called tales from mother base uh you want to talk about that some yeah sure um it uh it sort of started um as me making some custom missions using some of the uh, modders resources that are available to make custom missions and you can actually add them into the game and it's fully playable. Um, so I was making a couple of uh, side ops um, and I wanted to kind of, I guess, promote them and, and show them off. So I, m I made like a cinematic video to kind of, uh, of the mission um, being played. Gotcha. Um, and from there then, I had so much fun making the cinematic videos that I started making um, I kind of flipped it around and I was going in with the intent of making cinematic videos and then the the, the side ops, the mods themselves were kind of just an, not an afterthought but you know the, the primary reason for doing this was the uh, um, making the, the cinematic videos and it was 
it's it's a, I wanted to kind of expand the story of MGS5 out, but in a law friendly way and from the perspective of Diamond Dog soldiers. Um, so that's that's where that sort of came from. Um, that's a cool position to like direct from too. That's there's a lot of just different uh, possibilities from just like, hey, what what missions are these guys doing today? It's you know, yeah, it can yeah, be like pretty much anything that you can come up with. I mean, you know, uh, you can send your soldiers out on deployment missions, but that's just essentially text box and it's all going on in the background. But it was it kind of came from the idea of well. You know, diamond dogs are sent on missions. What what would that look like? You know, so that's a cool idea. But uh, again, I uh, you know uh, don't mean to <laughs> just hardcore advertise Infinite Heaven, but it's 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 a lot of it is done with Infinite Heaven because it allows you to you know move the camera away from the player, um, do all sorts of crazy things like change the depth of field and the focus of the camera and the aperture and all this crazy stuff. So it was a way to kind of play around with those tools as well. Yeah, I really want to give that a shot. I just need to get a computer that's not a potato. <laughs> <laughs> I will help you. I will help you build a computer, Nitroid, just for you to play um, Infinite Heaven. Because, <laughs> no, I, seriously, I second that motion because that mod, um, I played the game twice. Uh, once on PS4 and once on, on PC. And, and that mod increase the longevity of that game for me so much and especially i think i think that's right i think we could get a lot of content out of you in particular if we give you that mod so oh god i'd love to watch you play mgs5 with infinite Heaven. oh yes I'd See, in okay that. so so all right you know confession time and some people already know this but i may i may know a few things about these games that does not necessarily reflect as me being good at these games. You don't have to be. Like, All right? You don't have to be good to like experiment. You know. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, dude! I, I did a stream the other day, and like I, I messed up so much. Like it was the worst luck I've ever had playing Metal Gear Solid, and I was just like, "Wow, this is this is impressive how much I'm screwing up." And it was on stream, so it was just like, "Okay, this is great." Yep, that's me on a weekly basis. Just tons of people watching. No pressure. Yeah, doing speed running on stream with chat too. Like that's just I don't know, man. It's so distracting. So it's you, you guys are on yeah, another how do you level, do man. That? That's yeah. that's some respect oh, was... and some kudos on, <laughs> for you guys. It was yeah, I mean, um <laughs> I made a lot of mistakes that I'd never made before. I'd been practicing this thing for about a week and a half and like the tank yeah. fight, fighting the tank. I I think I did that. Um I don't know. Twenty times. I feel like that should be a subcategory of of uh, speed running. Be like chat enabled. Like <laughs> <laughs> chat percent. Oh shit! Good. This guy's hardcore. I was about to say just just a barrage of a barrage of of people saying reset at all moments. It sounds awful. Did we want to look into some of the Q and A and get 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 Adam on this Q and A? Sounds good to me. Could do that. Yeah. Got through most of our normal questions. Yeah. Let's hit it. All right. At Quick Quack Man asks, what are your thoughts on Kojima Productions making films directed by Hideo Kojima in the future? Huh. Hmm. <laughs> it's going to take them away from, from working on games, so I don't like that. But I, I do kind of want to see what he's got up his sleeve for films. Um, I'm curious how he can operate in a short span of time where you don't have a, you know, a 30 hour game that you can pad out with a dozen hours of cutscenes, but you have to tell like a self-contained story in an hour and a half to two hours. Yeah. You don't have all that exposition and shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it'll, and, and I've noticed in the past that Kojima tends to work well under those kind of restrictions when he's, when he has to work in a small space is when you get the more interesting things. I mean, just look at PT. Yeah. Which is still amazing. I think we were talking about it the other day while we were watching, um, stealth and Adam's Adam speed run too. Like even metal gear solid one, you know, despite the fact that it was, you know, sort of beginning the beginnings of long cutscenes, I feel like the pacing on that is so well done. It's the most contained Metal Gear game. Yeah, you never felt like you were you were uh, 
like it was dragging on. Yeah. I mean, even when you got to like the backtracking in the communications tower and whatnot, there was always something to kind of keep you engaged. Um, I would argue that the backtracking in MGS1 is actually part of why the uh, revelation of who you've been talking to is so impactful. Because you've just finished putting in all that effort of like reheating the key and freezing the key and there's been all this drama and it's been this this long ongoing endeavor and then you're finally done and you breathe a sigh of relief and nope we just used you buddy <laughs> played like a damn fiddle yep and that's when uh snake realizes the extent to which he got played they played us like a damn fiddle and to the extent that the player got played they played us like a damn fiddle I mean, it just it fits. And, and that actually is going to be sort of the answer to my question, um, or the answer to the question, rather, is on the, co- like, as far as I visualize a Kojima film, you know, the downsides, the downside is that it's going to be, like, derivative as fuck. Um, so <laughs> I, I expect a lot of, like, homages and connections and things like that. But at the same token... Um, you know, I, I do think the the man is always interested in utilizing the medium to the best of its abilities. So, you know, to 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 while we are questioning if he can stay constricted in the film medium, um, I'm also curious to see how he can kind of push it forward or, or push it as much as he can without hopefully making like a four hour movie. Yeah, he definitely does like to like push whatever medium that he's working in and try to like figure something out that hasn't been done before. Or- you know, try to put some cool novelty on it. I, I do feel like the movie would almost have this like effect of like they're just like constantly pulling the mask off, like in Scooby Doo, where it's just like, "Haha, it was actually this person." No, wait, it's actually this person. Like, hopefully, it's not a uh, M Night Shyamalan type ordeal. Most of Kojima's innovations tend to come out through gameplay rather than just the cutscenes, though. So I wonder if doing traditional film is like tying his hands behind his back. See, I used to think that too, but I don't think we're, I think that's sort of like a glass half empty type of perspective and a sense that, you know, we're not think we're thinking more of like, oh, he's constricted, but because he doesn't have gameplay rather than, oh, here's another avenue. He could do some of that tricky shit, but utilize the film medium or even like elements of, of film mediums. Like, I don't know, like a streaming service or, uh, you know, some sort of like something like Bandersnatch. I was exactly. On, I was on, thinking uh, Bandersnatch exactly, and it doesn't. It doesn't have to be a choose your own adventure because <laughs> I feel like that's that came out and he was probably like son of a bitch. I was going to do that. <laughs> 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 and uh, it's funny because one of the actors in that he's going to be in another choose your adventure game from uh, the folks who did Until Dawn. Yeah. So, I guess he really likes that genre. I don't know. What are your thoughts on it, Adam? I'm not sure. I kind of, I kind of feel where where Nitroid's coming from. To be honest, I, I don't know how. You know, he's he's got all these years of experience making games, um, which is obviously very long form, um, and you're not going to be able to have that same sort of freedom to dump exposition in in one way or another when you may only have three hours or or whatever it is, you know? So I I am kind of cautiously optimistic. Um, I'm really curious how his style of storytelling is going to translate into, you know, a shorter form story. Well, they say brevity is the soul of wit. Um, But when it comes to making movies, the only real example we have of something that is a self-contained film, I guess you could say. And, and we've talked about this a bit in previous episodes, was the, um, the Metal Gear Solid 3 Existence disc that came included with the limited edition of Subsistence, where he took all of, all of Metal Gear Solid 3, um, made some you know unique gameplay recordings, and spliced the whole thing down into a three-hour movie. And it's an interesting experiment, but it doesn't really work as a film. 
Uh, it, it sort of reveals that, you know, Metal Gear, it really shows that Metal Gear Solid 3 only really works as a game. And I feel that way about kind of all of his work. I think Kefco Production did a good job at like cutting all the movies down and kind of just including enough of the codex scenes and the dialogue and splicing in just enough gameplay to where it kind of, for someone that ha- doesn't have access to the games or can't play them or doesn't want to watch a full Let's Play, that's kind of like a good way to just experience what the game is mainly about. It's like a... Yeah, but how long are those? Uh, for MGS3, that's four hours and 20 minutes. Um, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's like Lord of the Rings Extended Edition. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I saw a thread on Twitter sometime this week, too, that was speaking about, like, how people think that a video game movie should just be, you know, the, the highlights and the plot elements just kind of contained in like a two hour feature. But what they don't realize is that, you know, the reason why those highlights have so much impact is because they're interlaced with these more sort of like uh, downtimes with gameplay. So even even that kind right. of concept of just kind of putting the big cut scenes together, it, it's it, it logistically it kind of doesn't work in film, which you know I I it it didn't realize that it, it's it was something that it was in my brain, but I, I didn't really hit it until I saw it on that Twitter thread. Well, they tried that, that with Resident Evil, and look how that turned they out. They did. There's a lot of like blatant you know winks to the camera essentially about you know, scenes kind of lifted from the games, but without the context of everything else that surrounded those scenes, it just comes off weird. Doesn't work, yeah. And now they're going to try it again. <laughs> oh, do you uh, mean the Netflix show? No, or? Monster Hunter. Well, no, they've, they're, they're, re- this just came out this past week, but they're rebooting the Resident Evil film series as well. This is separate from the Netflix oh, series. God, no. Um, but they've said they're going to, it's going to be new actors, it's going to be, they've said faithful to the games, and they've already cast Chris Redfield, Jill Valentine, Leon S. Kennedy, Claire Redfield, Albert Wesker. I think they there was one more character they cast, which I'm wondering, are they doing two movies, or are they going to try and shove the first two games into one movie? Like, it's not clear, but they've already got the cast figured out. It's done by the same production company that did the previous series of movies, but it does sound like they want to make it more uh, more accurate to the games. But but we'll see. After what I've heard about the Netflix series, I'm not really yeah, hopeful. That sounds god awful. About the Wesker kids, right? Yeah. But are they are they all going to be like you know you've got like a, an eight year old and a six year old in black trench coats with sunglasses? <laughs> Come on. So Adam, where can people find you online? Adam online. <laughs> so you can catch me at twitch.tv slash Adam underscore online. Um, and you'll catch me on a weekly basis on a Saturday. Um, nine times in ten we're playing uh, something from the Metal Gear series or Kojima related. So, yeah, that's where you can catch me. We can throw it in the description. All right, man. Well, I think uh, that's going to wrap it up for today. Thanks again for coming on. We appreciate it. All right, guys, yeah, thanks. Thank uh, thanks very much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Big fan of the show. It's Always the highlight of my Monday. So, uh, yeah, cheers for having me on, guys. Thanks, buddy. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, man, I'm glad we could get you on, and I'm looking forward to seeing your rematch. Yeah, Yeah. it's coming. (laughs) Watch this space. When Nitroid finally gets a PC, we'll let you know, and then we'll we'll sit down with him and do, like, a a hardcore learning session on Infinite Heaven. Sounds good. Make fun of me as I get my ass kicked. (laughs) (laughs) 